Welcome to the Idaho Coordinated Response. I'm going to hand it over to Jen Martinez to get started. Thanks so much, Tamara. Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, are we ready? Yep, I think we are. Okay, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. And I hope y'all are settling in well and that your first half of the conference has been informative and enlightening and wonderful. And hopefully you are also, um, you know, nourished, you know, it's after lunch. So hopefully you're able to get a good snack, a good luncheon. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, our chat is open. Uh, and while we would love to have all of us introduce ourselves, um, you know, here, that would take up the entirety of the presentation today. So we're going to introduce yourself, ourselves to you, uh, but we'd also love for y'all to introduce yourselves to us so that we kind of know who's in the space with us today. Um, so we're going to go ahead and post um, our questions that we're going to be answering as well into the chat box and invite you to participate um, through there as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and model uh, what that looks like. So hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Martinez. My pronouns are she, hers, and ella, if you're talking to me in Spanish. Um, and I am one of the co-facilitators for the Idaho Coordinated Response Team, um, facilitated through the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. Um, and I joined the team in about, oh gosh, 2018, late 2018, or early 20, 2019, um, when I was a staff member for the Idaho Coalition. Um, and have been just a part of this team still, um, even since my departure, just because I care about this work so much. Um, I'm joining you from Boise, Idaho, which is where I'm located, um, which are the um, previously unceded lands of the Shoshone Bandic and Shoshone Paiute peoples um, here in Idaho. And the prompt that we're gonna ask you, which is a fun question, which um, you know, our, my other co-facilitators can let you know that we like to start our meetings with fun questions or reflective questions just to kind of get us in the mode of, of talking, which we would be doing with you if we were in space with you today. So the question is, what is the weather in your head? Um, and so I will share that the weather in my head is sunny because I'm just returning from a three-day weekend for Memorial Day uh, where I got to escape Boise for a little bit, um, got up into North Idaho uh, with no or to very little cell service. So the weather in my head is sunny with a few clouds here and there to provide a little bit of a respite from the sun, but overall a very good weather in my head today. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off um, to, um, to my colleague. Um, sorry, I think who is next right now? Melissa, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and kick it to you right now. Oh, it is so good to be with y'all today. I wish I could be there in person, but I can't tell you as an extrovert how motivated I am just to see some faces on my screen. Oh, it's exciting. As Jen said, my name is uh, Melissa. Um, I also serve in the Senate, and I was asked to serve as a facilitator, a co-facilitator of this team based on some of the background I have in gender studies and being a women's center coordinator, as well as the direct experience I had providing advocacy work for victims and survivors of sexual and domestic violence at Boise State. And I can tell you, as many of you probably know, that position giving direct service and support to somebody who has been harmed was probably the most informative, transformative space I have ever occupied and really is what taught me most about leadership because in that space, in that space, you have to truly deeply respect the person's experience, not put your own agenda forward, and to create space for folks to tell the story they need to tell and seek the service they need. So when I was asked to co-facilitate this team, I was deeply honored and I, I continue to be so. So I'm calling today from Boise in my spare bedroom office and the weather in my head is full of thunderbolts because I'm ready to make change. <laughs> and thank you all for joining in the chat box and sharing that. I'm going to turn it over to Leo Morales, and he is going to share a little bit about him. Then we're going to go to Doug, and we're going to go back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, Jen, and thank you, everyone, for joining. So Leo Morales, uh, he, him, his pronouns, and I'm at the ACLU, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union. And uh, so I've, I started with the, uh, I started 
I became part of the project when it started, I, which I don't even remember, Melissa, you may know exactly when it actually started. And here in, in a little bit later, I'll share more kind of my reactions when I was asked. But again, I've been with the coordinated response team since the inception. Um, happy to be here as well to share some of the learnings and um, you know my participation uh, during these last several years. Um, and uh, I, of course, am also joining from, uh, like Jan from the city, and, and Melissa from the city of Boise. And uh, um, as Jen indicated, uh, lands of the Shoshone, uh, uh, Shoshone Bannock and Paiute uh, from uh, many years ago. Um, let's see here, what's the weather like in my head? Um, it's, that's an excellent question, Jen. Um, weather in my head, I guess I'm ready to go, right? So there's, there's some sun and maybe some lightning, just, and, and good lightning, I, I like lightning. Because uh, it's a spark. It's a good spark. And I love sparks because I think they're very important. Uh, that leads us to actions. So I will pass it on to Doug. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. It's good to see so many people here. Um, I recognize some of you, some of you are new, um, but welcome. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to participate with this group. Because um, it's one of my favorite um, groups that, that I'm involved with. Um, I've learned a lot over the last years. Um, I'm the uh, council chairperson, and that's kind of how I fit into this, this team um, of the Council of Domestic Violence and Victim Assistance. I'm the chairperson, currently the chairperson. Uh, my tenure is going to end in July, and, and I'm going to step down from that position, but um, I've been there for many years. Um, I also have a background in law enforcement and social work. I worked 28 years in law enforcement, doing a little bit of everything. Ended up out at Post Academy where I spent about 12 years and that's where I retired from. And then I went into uh, practicing social work for about eight years as uh, a social worker, um, dealing primarily with um, foster kids. And that was kind of in my background. Um, now I'm just retired fully. And I'm, I like to tell people I'm a professional skier because that's, that's what I'm doing with my retirement. I work part-time at, at Bogus Space and on the ski patrol. So that's me. And uh, again, welcome to you all. Great. Great. Thank you, Doug. And again, thanks for everybody for coming. We're going to stick, or we're going to try to stick to the agenda. So I'm going to let you a little bit let you know a little bit about the Idaho Coordinated Response Team. This team was actually first formed in 2007, and it was a team that was brought together to look at systems assisting folks uh, who were experiencing sexual and domestic violence and stalking. And the team initially was loaded with amazing criminal legal professionals. And they were looking at systems and coordinating efforts to try to improve on those systems. And actually, they came out with some products. There was an executive order that the governor's office made about domestic violence. And there was uh, something, a tool you probably are very well familiar with called uh, the Idaho, the, the risk of dangerousness assessment, the Idaho, the IR, the IRAD, right? Idaho risk of danger, Idaho. Oh, heavens, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the risk of dangerousness. And actually that's a tool that many folks have been using to assess risk in situations to assist people who are being harmed in their homes, right? So what happened was that team came up with these amazing products and uh, some years passed and folks said, hey, we need to come together again, but you know what? Let's look at something deeper. And that we a lot of times talk about in our field being very victim centered and, and ensuring that we're listening to the, vo the voices of folks being harmed. And in this coordinated response team, a grant was written and people from criminal legal systems came together for the first time in a structure with community partners that represented folks from historically marginalized communities. There had been a ton of research being done on the disproportional effects uh, that were being suffered by folks who are from historically marginalized communities. And how could we center those voices? Well, folks came together and said, let's 
bring criminal legal professionals and these community partners together over the course of time, develop relationship, and examine the systems that we have in place. Now, the main purpose of this coordinated response team grant was to look at the impacts of gender uh, bias on systems and how we could reduce harm and actually prevent and address bias in our systems. And um, I can tell you, uh, folks were really excited to do that. But as one of the facilitators, when we met with our criminal legal professionals and our community partners, each had a little bit different thing to say as we approached the, the challenge. And I can tell you, everybody was excited. The criminal legal professionals that I met with them, I said, oh, hey, you all, I know you're excited to do this work, but we are really going to examine, critically examine systems from that lens of folks marginalized. That means we're going to criticize the very systems that we work in, right, every day. Oh, it'll be fine. Everybody's open to it. I said, I know. Sandy Jones is kind of smiling. I see her on my screen. She was a member of our original team. There's Kim. But uh, I said, hey, I know we're, I know we're excited, but I, I anticipate we'll resist a little bit because it's, that's kind of common, right? When you're criticizing the very system you're working in, it's, it's pretty common to say, hey, that's not me. Um, and we individualize it instead of look at a system. When I talked to the community partners, I see a few of them on the line. They were excited too, but a little more hesitant, some of them, right? because some of the things they told me were, hey, Melissa, what's gonna be different? We've shared these stories before. We wanna make sure there's actual change because you're taking us away from our office and our work. That was the first learning moment for me, somebody who had been working in systems my whole life and thought I was a pretty sensitive person that, uh, hey, there's something I hadn't been hearing. So this team has been meeting now for three years. It started in 2018. We meet every other month except for legislative session. So we haven't met since uh, January. Um, and for obvious reasons during legislative session, a lot of the stakeholders are really busy. And this one went a little long, so we haven't met again yet. <laughs> we won't talk about that, but Every other month and in between, we do some pair meetings so that I match people up to build relationships. And what I said at the very beginning as a co-facilitator is we don't have a specific outcome in mind. We wanna put people together, get creative and innovative. And I think the outcome will move us, right? So that's a little bit of history of the Idaho Coordinated Response Team and where we are and how long we've been doing it. We'd love to share one of the voices from one of our team members now to give you a little perspective from what she thinks about the team and that this is a little video clip that Jen is going to share with us on her screen from Christine Pisani from the Council for Developmental Disabilities. I would say that at first I have a lot of resistance. I would say that at first, I you can't hear anything, can you? To being a part of the team, you can because of the amount of work I've done over the years to try to have the voices of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities heard um, in a sea of needs in our state, and oftentimes uh, because. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities are, I would say, invisible to many community members. Their needs are often not met, and uh, they typically tend to be more of a devalued community member and aren't recognized as contributing members of the community. So when I was first approached to be part of it, I thought, you know, this is just going to be one more opportunity to have a seat at the table, but I wasn't sure that there would be any meaningful outcomes for people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. I would say that once I committed and was part of a very unique 
process that I I can't say in 27 years of working at the Council on Developmental Disabilities have ever been a part of a of a of an approach that had as much meaning as far as building relationships as the Idaho Coordinated um, Task Force has. So I would say the relationship building and the intentional meetings, the one-on-one -on -one meetings that were set up, uh, those made a huge difference in the ability to connect with people that want to understand what the work of the council is and then would also afford me the opportunity to understand the work of their agency and allowed us to connect in really grounded ways that help to center the lives of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Thank you, Jen, for sharing your screen. Um, and thank you, Christine, I know you're on the call. I really appreciate you sharing that. And again, remember the purpose of this team is to look at sexual domestic violence through the lens of historically marginalized communities so we could work to prevent and reduce gender bias in systems so we could better serve those folks being harmed, period. And therefore we have to center those voices. So folks who came to the table uh, you know, our traditional legal partners, uh, the attorney general's office, sheriff's office, uh, offices, police, pardons and parole, juvenile corrections, corrections, etc., And folks from the community, people who worked with refugees, people with developmental intellectual disabilities, folks who are deaf and hard of hearing, uh, people, uh, people of color, uh, et cetera, people from the LGBT community, okay? So that's what Christine's talking about in that video is a little bit of trepidation about, hey, I've shared this before, but what difference is it gonna make? Um, and centering hopefully those voices so we could truly listen and incorporate things as we go. Um, and I've worked in systems a long time and I, again, thought I was doing a pretty good job, but this process really taught me um, to uh, really listen and incorporate those voices. So what we, the purpose of our session today is really looking at coordinated community response teams. Now we know those in very, in a lot of different names, right? There are multidisciplinary teams, sexual assault response teams, there are child advocacy teams and so forth. So what we'd like to do now is get your, we'd like to invite you in the chat to share some of the things you think about or characteristics, descriptions, when you think community coordinated response team, what is that, right? List about three things that come to your mind that would describe a community, a coordinated community response team. On your marks, get set, go. <laughs> and then we're gonna talk a little bit about those. We're gonna watch that chat fill up. I think we're clicking on the link, uh, Melissa, for the mentee. So if they could click on the link to enter their answers and we can share the screens like as they're populating, so. Yes, thank you, Jen, I forgot to mention that. That's why we have co-facilitators. So not using the chat, we're gonna click on the link in the mentee, in the chat, excuse me, and those are gonna populate, perfect. Love it. So in the chat, you'll see a link, it's called mentee. And you're going to click on that link and you're going to populate it with your answers and they're going to we're going to watch in real time collect here. Mm. These are great common interest collaboration. Empathy. Mission driven cohesive unified. Oh, I love that transparency working together. Open-minded. That's great. Client-centered, working toward a common goal, teamwork, inter-community, 
this internal reflection is really important to our group. We did a lot of learning and capacity building and reflection. Um, and I noticed for myself constantly having to examine some of the reactions I was having and understanding those and why, all to better inform my work would put people in trauma. That's exact trauma informed. Excellent. Boy, they just keep coming. Now, um, great. I'd like to call on a couple folks if you'd be willing. Are you open to that, I hope? As you see some of these rolling on the screen, um, feel free to, because I can't see everyone right now because I'm sharing my screen, which is great. I'd like, if you'd like, I'd like a couple people just popcorn style chime in about why you wrote what you wrote or if something else actually resonates with you. I know Kim Dugan's on the phone, so I might call on her first to get us started. Kim can't get out of it. Anyone want to comment? Go, Kim. All right. I put unified, and I saw somebody else put um, communicating together. And it's just like that to me resonates that if we're all coming together collectively in a unified response, in a, in a coordinated response, um, as the team is entitled, um, I think that that will work to better serve the survivors that we're working with and getting us to the next step on where we need to be to provide those services. Yeah, that coordination is so important. And we heard in an earlier um, presentation, it sounds like with one of the judges talking about coordinating our efforts, especially when something new transpires. So I don't know if you remember, Kim, we had that meeting after the Clark decision and all of us came together, community partners and criminal legal professionals and so forth. And hey, what can we do here, right? Go, and also that it doesn't, sorry. Also that it doesn't necessarily mean that we're all in agreement all the time, um, but it, but a healthy discussion, because unified doesn't mean all the same necessarily in your thinking, but that we're unified in our goals towards achieving that. Does that make sense? It does. Um, Christine, I want to call on you real quick because I think you focused on this. So if we're gonna coordinate and collaborate and have discussions like Kim said, how important is it to build relationship? Well, it was the key to having trust, uh, to be able to sit in a room and hear the perspective of law enforcement and really have a better, I mean, whole change in the way I thought about the way law enforcement's day looks like. Um, and then for them in turn to understand the perspective of the trauma that so many individuals have experienced and um, how to be trauma informed and what that looks like with various communities. So without the pairing of the pair meetings and really the intentional time that we spent being together, um, that trust wouldn't have developed. And I don't think we would have had the really juicy, meaty conversations that really got us to a, a whole different level of discussion about what the future could look like. Oh, thank you, Christine. So again, something that I never really thought about when I was coordinating and creating a community response team in my university, I was always thinking about product, product, product. But over the course of time, I built relationships here that now with that trust, uh, it goes, the conversations go differently, right? And we're not as uh, personally hurt when we talk about a system improvement. And we know that people are good people we're working with, right? So it allows us to criticize a system without criticizing the person. We hear that a lot. Great. Thank you so much for participating in that and sharing. I'm going to turn it over to Jen and she's going to ask you another question and we're going to do that again, but I really appreciate you doing that. Totally. Thanks so much, Melissa. And part of the reason too that we do this is because we do feel like it's super important to create a shared 
understanding and shared knowledge. So to make sure we're all on the same page when we're having these conversations, because we do all come in with different lived experiences, different career experiences. And before we can really get to doing the work, we need to know that we're even on the same page about the terms that we're talking about. And so the next question that we're gonna ask you, and I'm gonna pop the question to the chat with the link again, a different link to submit your answers, is what does it mean to be victim-centered, right? We often hear a lot of folks using this buzzword of victim-centered, um, and sometimes that means different things. So we're going to um, pop that in here. If you could go ahead and submit what you think victim-centered means, and we're going to share the answers on the screen right now as well. This is great. Thank you y'all for providing responses, centering the victim, right? Always is first priority. Yeah, seeing the some answers around being non-judgmental when a victim is coming forward. I think that's really important for us to hold, especially with regards to the coordinated response team In our time having these meetings, we really had to address, are we being non-judgmental when someone is telling us their story? Are we able to analyze and confront biases that we may or unconsciously have, right? That we weren't even aware of when helping people or when doing our work. And so I really want to, I'm going to keep these on the screen so that we can keep reading them and absorbing them and processing them. And if folks feel, um, you know, something to reflect on while we're looking at these answers about what victim-centered means is which victims, which victims are we centering? You know, who are we maybe unintentionally leaving behind in our work? You know, who doesn't feel comfortable coming forward to seek services? Um, who doesn't feel like they have someone who might understand the different um, cultural nuances or experiences that they might be having to navigate while dealing with, um, with an experience that's traumatic. And when we have someone who is different from us, are we able to hear their story without that judgment? Are we able to hear that story without any preconceived notions that we might have of um, the way that we think we understand, you know, their culture or their background or their lived experience. So just kind of um, something to think about there. And I think there was a really good example, um, Melissa, that you had um, that I think really kind of um, got to the core of who are we unintentionally leaving behind. And I believe it was like an example of if we have, and if I get this wrong, forgive me, but if we have, for example, someone who's a farm worker, um, who, you know, already exists in a rural area and we know services are just harder to get in rural areas. And it's, that's my lived experience. I grew up in a rural part of the Southern part of the state here in Idaho. Um, and they experience some sort of sexual, um, assault or violence and they try to seek services, but no one speaks Spanish. You know, there's, there's a barrier there already. And if they are undocumented or don't have legal documentation, then there's another fear factor that comes in there. And there are questions that might come up or biases that might come up for folks on, well, like, 
focusing on that versus they experience a sexual assault um, situation and they're trying to seek services. And if they're afraid of being deported versus getting the services they need, then are we actually centering the victim when it comes to situations like this? And that's just one example, um, right? There's so many different examples that we could come up with, but that's one of the reasons that this specific uh, um, gathering of the Idaho Coordinated Response Team is focusing on historically marginalized communities, right? Not just about race, but also about different abilities, right? We heard from Christine about intellectual and developmental disabilities. You're gonna hear from Director Stephen Snow about the communities that are um, deaf or hard of hearing, right? And the different barriers that they navigate. Um, it, there's so many different things and we really need to be aware of how or why those folks might not be coming or feel comfortable coming to seek help. And how do we start to dismantle whatever those barriers are so that we truly are providing access to resources for every single person um, in Idaho, right? Every single person should be able to feel like they have somewhere to go for help. And so that's really what we're analyzing and trying to dive deep into, which is why we focused so much on relationship building because these conversations can get hard, especially when we've spent our lives working within the, the systems, right? Um, and so it took a lot of, a lot of um, being humble for all of us in different ways to be able to tackle these conversations. Um, so thank you so much for, for, for indulging us in this conversation. Um, I know that this can get kind of tricky, but we are here to help share what we learned, not only our successes, but also where things got hard for us so that um, you can replicate a community, uh, coordinated community response team in your area as well. Um, Melissa, is there anything you wanna add here on this part at all? Yeah, I just really appreciate that, Jen. That was um, I, that overview and for that activity, y'all. Um, I mean, I guess I really want to impress upon folks that the work that we were doing for this last three years, again, our purpose is to look at systems through the lens of historically marginalized communities of folks being harmed in sexual, domestic, or stalking situations, right? And I think we can all agree our jobs, no matter what, what position, whether it's law enforcement, an advocate, a nurse, whatever it is, we're in this to help folks. And sometimes we're not always, um, I think traditionally or historically from my, my own upbringing, um, haven't been as sensitive to folks who are more marginalized uh, by race or physical ability or sexual orientation, et cetera. And this, this opportunity really, as Jen said, humbled and taught me different lived experiences and to really listen. I, and I remember uh, Director Snow talking about um, in the deaf community, you know, stories where folks had sought services, but there was no translator. Uh, and law enforcement may have used the perpetrator for uh, translation, which is, you know, probably, you know, not the best thing to do. In fact, you should not do that. Um, folks who went to a shelter and maybe not services there and then slept on a porch until they could find a friend. I mean, those kind of things. Doesn't mean that, you know, we're bad people, but we have to examine those systems to be ready to accommodate a variety of folks from very different lived experiences. So boy, what a great opportunity and a blessing I've had sharing the, the team on this team. So thank you for that. As we move, so, so one of the really interesting things about this team that's different than any other community response team I've been a part of is the intentionality. And early on, we said, hey, you know what? We get into habits, right? We think we know, you know, the best practices and what we should do. Um, but this team, we said, hey, we're going to look at practicing things, not just getting into habits. And so we created some approaches that were different. And we're going to share a few of those differences. And we actually have created a toolkit, so to speak, of um, how this whole thing went and some things that we've learned that folks might incorporate in their own teams to really um, uh, capture some of the things you're hearing today. Um, and we're not gonna worry, basically we know who all is on the call. So we're gonna, when we finish the toolkit, we're almost there. We'll send you a link so you can see it. 
and you can get some of these practices of your own and we'll share it. Um, I'm going to start off with a few practices I think are essential when we're coordinating a team, things that I learned, and then we're going to pass around the team. But first and foremost, uh, who facilitates a team is really important. And in this case, what we chose were co-facilitators. Uh, a woman of color, Jim Martinez, myself, a white woman. I come from a systems perspective right now. She comes from a community partners perspective. And when we chose that team, and there's other people on the team, but we're the main facilitators, that really helps create a formal structure, right, of seeing what we're trying to do, right, and acknowledging that we have uh, been raised and socialized in similar systems and uh, having a diverse lived experience and perspectives is really important on a team to facilitate it. The other thing that we did right out of the gate is we created roles and expectations for team members as well as for us. And I met individually with every team member and said, here's what you're getting into. Are you good with it? And we were really open and honest and direct about it. And so everybody knew they were invited on the team and here's what's gonna happen. And again, really being honest with, it's gonna be challenging. Uh, it's gonna be tough. But uh, if we build those relationships, we're gonna hang in there together and we're gonna, we're gonna do well. So I think facilitators is important, meeting up front, making sure everybody understands what we're going to do, uh, what's expected, kind of the culture of things. Um, and then the other thing that um, I did is uh, we did a what is called a collaboration profile. It's something I'm licensed to give, but it's a very simple assessment looking at your tendencies to collaborate in groups. So whether you have a tendency to be more product idea, people, or process oriented. And that actually came in handy because it normalizes our different tendencies when we collaborate. Some of us wanna get right out of the gate and get something done. Others of us wanna build friendships and have friends and get to know each other, and that's me. Others want to generate ideas and be critical, which is so important. And other folks are focused on how do we get this thing done? What's the process? And you need all those types on the team, I can tell you. Um, but that really, that shared language and understanding of all of our differences normalized that and really helped us resolve conflict as we had it. So setting the table, right facilitators. I'm not saying I'm the right one, but being mindful of it. Because sometimes we just go, okay, we're going to let the prosecutor do that because it's about criminal legal processes. Disrupt that thinking. They might be on the team or a part of it, but think if you want to center voices, which voices need to be center, right? Not to denigrate law enforcement or prosecutors, but we got to think about this a little bit differently and be a team. Those are the things that I would share. I'm going to turn it over now to, how about to Doug? We're going to hear from him about some of the practices that he really thought were great and what he learned. Thank you, Melissa. Um, you know, being on this team is uh, was so unique in the fact that that we did things that um, you don't normally do it, you know, on on task forces teams, at least I had never done. And, and it's so it, it, it caused it stretched us, it, um, it um, caused us to think, or at least it caused me to think critically about a lot of things that I really hadn't thought of before. Um, and some of it was was difficult, but one of the things that we did that I really enjoyed is we did a we did a common read, um, and and what it was, basically it was a book club, and we got we uh, chose um, three different books I think we read uh, together, and uh, it wasn't not all of the team participated, but um, the ones that did I think we really appreciated. Um, so basically, we, we were talking about the first first book we talked about was the um, decriminalizing domestic violence. And this interesting part or uh, thought about that book was is that that it um, it really stretched the way that that we we looked at at the issue. It went beyond just the regular things that everybody does to to deal with domestic violence, and it really challenged our thinking. Um, I, I remember one one person that um, was was reading the book. One of the things that that she had to say was that um, I have to hide this book. I feel like I have to hide the book when I walk into my place of work because of the uh, you know just kind of it was kind of a um, a different way of approaching this this issue. And she was and 
And I think that was, we all felt that a little bit. But then we worked, we talked about a couple um, uh, race issue books. One, the uh, My Grandfather's Hands, which was uh, Rezma Miakam was is the author. Um, there's a book that will challenge you on race about um, the whole idea of trauma and trauma in within ourselves and within our communities and within our nations and with which in our in different um, different different groups and how, how to deal with that trauma. Um, again, another book that really pushed the envelope on on how we we really dealt with how we have to feel things and that was um, uh, a real eye opener for me that that this kind of stuff um, it comes at us in such a way that that we actually feel it in our body and and in the book really helps you work through that a little bit and so in the final one we talked so you want to talk about race and that was um, just a good a good discussion to to how to have this discussion and I think it was all timely at the time we were doing it. Um, We'd all gone into lockdown about that time and we had a lot of time to read. So it was, um, it was a good process. So that was one of the, um, one of the uh, projects that we did that, that I thought was um, really helpful. The other one we did as a group, we did a, uh, was called a 100 year reflection. And, and Melissa had us imagine that, that it's 100 years in the future and a relative is writing to you to thank you about uh, of the work that you did to make the community a better place. And that was just a, um, I was really surprised at, at how um, the commonality of responses and how, you know, really across the board in that, at least in the group that we were working in, we all kind of had the same vision for for our future, how we wanted to make it better. And so it gets you thinking again and challenging, um, you know, just gets you out of the norm. And that's that's what I appreciate about a, a lot of the um, exercises that we did. It they, they took you out of your comfort zone and put you in looking at things from a whole nother issue, which I really appreciated. So those are two that I, that I could think of. Um, we wanna turn it over to Leo next. Certainly, thank you very much, Doug, for passing it over. As far as for me and reflections here, um, the point that I'll stress is, um, it's already been mentioned, right, around relationships. Uh, our facilitator, Melissa, is a, is a, a, did a wonderful, uh, at the beginning, and Jen joined us later and combined, what an incredible team we have. But the, the, the work around the focus on relationship was very critical uh, all of us had an opportunity to do one-on-one -on -one meetings with other folks, with other participants that otherwise maybe we would not have met in a setting where it's not talking specifically about policy, but the goal was really to get to know each other better. As Tamara, I think Tamara mentioned, trust was at the core uh, of some of the work that we were about to engage in. And I, again, had the opportunity to, to have multiple conversations with different participants, uh, multiple um, sheriffs, chiefs of police, uh, other individuals that typically were on the opposite side, right, as um, ACLU is, is, is uh, holding <laughs> our partners accountable for, for some of the actions that we, we have difference of opinions. Um, but, you know, I sat down with Josh T. Walt, Department of Correction, uh, Sheriff Rick Henry, uh, uh, Madison County uh, and uh, Twin Falls Chief of Police, uh, uh, Craig Kingsbury, and so on. There was multiple individuals I sat down with, and what was really beautiful, again, was an opportunity for us to sit down more at the human level. We actually talked a lot about family. Family was very core of, of all the conversations that I had with individuals. We also talked about just, you know, what brings us joy. Uh, and we talked about uh, styles of leadership. And uh, one of the stories that I remember, I will always remember was uh, I was out doing development work, fundraising work in East Idaho. And I thought, well, I'm already in near Madison County. I'm gonna give, uh, you know, our, our good buddy, a quick sheriff, our sheriff there, a quick call and just go visit and sit down and, and chat. And we had a long conversation in his office. And I remember 
him talking about, um, you know, a documentary about farm workers. It's a team out of California. Uh, my goodness, I'm skipping the name of the of the of the actual documentary right now. But it's about a team of track runners uh, in California at a school um, where you know individuals have essentially been forgotten, and uh, uh, the 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 school that this individual actually is an Idaho coach who was removed from Idaho for uh, you can watch the documentary lands a job in California and then uh, starts and he's a football coach American football uh, and uh, starts this track program there and uh, you know so it's a it's a great documentary and and uh, the sheriff shows this to all of his deputies all of his staff and and says we're going to watch this to, to actually learn about leadership. And uh, thank you, McFar McFarling USA. It's, it's a great, great documentary. And we just start, we just, you know, we, we went pretty deep in talking about leadership and our own leadership styles and work in the community as well, which I don't know that I would have had that co conversation uh, with the sheriff if it wasn't because of this set, uh, setting. Uh, you know, we likely would have been talking about either why we file or we're thinking of filing the lawsuit, but no, it was a conversation about leadership and about trust. And now I know that, you know, I, the relationship that I now have with the sheriff is different. And if there are issues with regards to the jail, I can pick up the phone knowing that we, there's a relationship that I have and have a conversation with the sheriff. And that's the theme again, that I, uh, that, that I picked out from, from the one-on-ones that we had it was an opportunity for us to really get to know each other at that human level. Um, second, I'll also add that what I really appreciate about the project was the financial investment in community partners as well, right? It, it's, uh, it takes time and effort and resources to pull community agencies or members from the community to participate in this project. So I was very happy that the coalition and our facil facilitators also emphasized the, the sharing of resources to make it possible uh, for other community members to be able to participate. And last, um, just want to re, re also uplift what Doug shared with regards to the, to the books that, that were read. I actually did not participate in the club. I did read the books in part because, you know, I, I wanted to read it at my own pace and, uh, and just, it's busy, right? We all have different calendars. And so, but I, I had the opportunity to read my grandmother's hand and it has completely well, I'm not sure about completely, but it has significantly impacted how I view, uh, you know, racialized trauma and trauma in general. And the book focuses on three particular groups, uh, black community members, white community members and law enforcement. The author is a social worker, but has been doing significant amount of work with law enforcement. And I thought, well, this is a very different way of looking at the issue. And I highly recommend it, particularly, you know, um, with with the times that we find ourselves in a reckoning with uh, with with our history around race. It's an incredible approach taken by the author. And again, because of the coordinator response and the recommendation of different books that have already been looked at, uh, I don't know that I would have picked up the book if it wasn't for our facilitators in this particular project. I'll stop there because I could probably just keep going, but I'll pass it back to Melissa or Jen. Yeah, thanks, Leo. Um, I, yeah, I miss being in community with y'all. I'm just gonna name it. Like having this conversation right now, I really wish we were at the Linen Building, like sharing food and having a conversation because I miss it. It's been too long. So I'm really looking forward for that happening again. Um, and I just, you know, I could add so many things, but I think I'm going to um, focus on a few different things here from what's been shared from my teammates here is the, the relationship building is crucial. Like you, I'm sure y'all have commented on a Facebook post and instantly regretted it because the conversation is not productive, right? Because you are not in relationship with folks the same way as if you invest the time and energy um, to really get to know someone before you have the hard conversations, right? Like Leo sharing about your experience with Sheriff Rick Henry is beautiful. Um, I really loved watching Christine and Irma Morin, who's the executive director of the Community Council of Idaho, like helps, like collaborating on projects in the middle of the pandemic. It was just 
wonderful to see the unexpected outcomes of really taking time to build relationships. And for me, it was also really important to highlight the voices of the community in spaces that are often harmful or toxic or re-traumatizing for so many of us. Um, and it was wonderful because there were moments where um, like Director Snow grew up in Gooding County. I grew up in Gooding County. We grew up like 10 miles away from each other. And because we had taken the time to have a conversation, we were able to share two very different experiences of our encounters with law enforcement growing up in Gooding County. And rather than getting defensive, we were just able to have a conversation about, that's awesome. I didn't have that experience. You didn't have my experience. And we can figure out a way forward because we did visioning 100 years into the future. We know our goal is the same. We know we want to get to the same place. We just had different experiences getting to where we are right now. And if we can focus on that, then we can have hard conversations about policy and we can have hard conversations about our biases because we all have them. No one doesn't have a bias. We all have them. But can we have a conversation and address that and make sure that the bias does not show up in the work that we're doing? And so those things really, like really were the most impactful for me because it gave me an opportunity also to understand what other people go through who are working within these agencies, who are law enforcement so that I can develop empathy there as well. And that's been the most beautiful part of this entire process. So I'll, I'll leave it there because um, we're gonna transition to the next part so we can make sure we get to questions. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna pass it to Melissa real quick. Just real quick, I wanna, um, I just wanna add to, I was deeply moved what Jen just shared is um, again, as you go in, as we go into community court, you know, coordinated community response teams, start teams, multidisciplinary teams, we have this outcome in mind. Like we're gonna, you know, do something to, in the system to hold somebody accountable for victimizing someone, right? And again, the thing that this team did was slow things down. And before we can actually get to the product we're gonna do, we have to truly listen and develop empathy. So we can have hard, hard conversations. And so we can actually improve systems. Without that step, I can tell you, I feel like I've been spinning my wheels this entire lifetime. That without truly listening without empathy, without the capacity building, without the personal reflection, without all those things, I am just doing something again. So this team, you know, three years in the making and we still haven't finished our outcome. The outcomes have come in the space we've created with each other in human presence. And that is something we take for granted in a commodity product driven culture. And so if there's anything I want to leave with folks today, it is to intentionally slow things down and intentionally stop yourself from doing what you habitually do and do something different. Back to Jen. Thanks, Melissa. Um, we're going to transition into a quick um, like fishbowl type of situation. So if we were in person, we would be sitting uh, in a circle with, an, inside, with another circle encompassed within our bigger circle so that we could observe a conversation happening between folks. But because we're on Zoom, our, our fishbowl people are Doug and Leo, and Melissa and I are gonna ask them a few questions. We're also gonna share some video responses from a couple of our other folks who were on the ICR team, who are on the ICR team. Um, and we encourage you, if you have questions, um, as we're having a conversation right now to pop them into the chat, um, you know, or write them down so you don't forget them because we really want to create some space at the end to help answer any questions or to gather questions and you can email us, um, you know, and we'll do our best to respond to you. But we're going to um, have two different perspectives, right? Leo's coming from the ACLU with the community perspective and really bringing that to the table. And Doug, you're coming, you know, as the chairperson for the council but also with a background in law enforcement and in social work, right? More of a systems-based uh, perspective. And so we're gonna ask you both questions with that in mind. And so I'm gonna go ahead and um, kick us off with the first question, which is what was your impression like when you were asked to participate? Do you remember how you felt and what you were thinking when you were first approached? And I'll go ahead and start with you, Leo. Thank you, Jen. Uh... 
I think as Christine probably shared earlier as well, I was a little bit hesitant, you know, that's just one, it's multiple things crossed my mind. One was like, first of all, what do I have to contribute, right? Because this I have, there wasn't like in the last round, as I learned the history, there wasn't community groups or the ACLU definitely was not involved the last go around. And so on the one hand, I thought, well, what do I have to contribute? That was one thing. And then second was, well, is this, is this a one more project where I will spend, you know, significant amount of time in meetings and then studying the issue and studying the issue again and again, and then where do we go from there, right? Uh, and I think that was crossing, that crossed my mind as well. Um, and uh, I think I was also concerned about the, the, the amount of time that, that it was going to take. Uh, I think all of us, right, in this video, we're, we're terribly busy because that's the culture that we live in in this country. It's like work, 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 it's busy. And at the organization here at the ACLU, I definitely have been working to create a culture of belonging, but also, which means a culture where we have work, uh, work and, and life balance, right? That's very critical. And so whenever I take on new projects, you know, I'm very careful with like a time commitment. So I was hesitant because I thought, and, and as, uh, as Melissa and Annie were sharing more about the project, on the values I believed, I, I was pulled in. On my practical side, I thought, I'm not sure. I'm not. And uh, what you doing? I need to mute, there you go. Um, and so those are the two things that were running through my mind. At the end of the day, they were very persuasive. And I thought, okay, well, let me jump in. Let me jump in because I thought at some point I can jump out, right, if, if it doesn't work. And so those were, you know, again, I was hesitant. I wasn't sure. I came in, but I believed in the mission. I believed in the mission. I believed in the vision. And I believed in the individuals that were calling me. And part of that is relationship too, right? I have a relationship with Melissa and Annie and the coalition. So that's what drew me in. And uh, I'll, I'll pause there just because I think I've made my point. Thanks, Leo. Um, and then right now we're gonna show you um, a clip from, sorry, Director Stephen Snow, who is the director for the Idaho Council for Developmental, or sorry, for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen there again really quick. So bear with me. And can you see Stephen? Just the thumbs up if you can see him. No? Okay, hold on a second. Okay, there we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Snow. I'm the executive director with the Idaho Council for the deaf and hard of hearing. We are a small independent state agency and our mission here at the council is to ensure that the quality of life for deaf and hard of hearing people of any age and in any walk of life and in any setting in life from education to employment to healthcare and so on. We want to ensure that their quality of life is commensurate with those who can hear. We want to ensure that those systems are open and available to everyone. We also want to ensure that policies are created in a way that doesn't create new barriers for those deaf and hard of hearing citizens. The reason why I'm involved with the ICR team is because deaf individuals are a marginalized community. They have unique needs, unique struggles that are often neglected. As we know, it's a battle to tackle such a large system. So we come to the Idaho Coordinated Response Team with concerns from our community. So those needs are made aware and so that we can brainstorm for more solutions to ensure that those deaf and hard of hearing people are getting their needs met. And we'll have videos also in the toolkit. So just be aware like there's more. Uh, we're just showing you three of these today. Um, and then from here, I'm gonna go to you, Doug. 
Thanks, Jen. Um, I guess I'd have to say, um, I kind of agree with a lot of what Leo said. When I was asked to um, to participate in this group, I, I, you know, my first response was, well, I, I was in the group, the original ICR group that did the original work. And that was mostly systems people as, as has been pointed out. And, and it was very product focused and we ground away for a couple of years and came out with a product and it was, it was okay. Um, so I guess, and when I came back was asked to, um, to participate as being um, on the, the Council for Domestic Violence and Victim Assistance, I said, well, I can bring, bring that to the table and we can um, see how this goes, but I was expecting kind of the same kind of group. And it wasn't that at all, I found out that it was, as, as Melissa has said, and, as, and they've done such a great job facilitating, is that let's slow this down and let's, let's really think about how we can be effective. And are we really being most effective with what we're doing? And, and I think, again, it came back to relationships. I, I kind of feel like I snuck onto this team because um, a lot of the people that were on the team, um, I've worked with in the past and I knew them as being professionals and you know, they were always just such a joy to work with. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still waiting for somebody to say, to realize I'm there and go, hey, what are you doing here? But, but um, I, I do uh, think that, um, you know, that's, I, I come back to, to the whole relationship piece. That's, that's what's really most important. And I would encourage, you know, if you're doing teams in your community um, on teams is, is to really think about that, that part of, of as Melissa said, sl slow it down and see, and really see, um, are you really meeting the needs of your community? So yeah, I'll bounce that back. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Doug. Um, for the next question, I think we've, I think you all have answered what was most rewarding about the experience, but if there's something additional you want to say, share what was rewarding and then blend that next part into what was most challenging. Okay. So if you want to add some reward, do it, but, and then challenge, we'll go to Leo. Thank you. Uh, rewarding the food. I'm just joking. I'm joking. The food was good. <laughs> there was good food uh, during the gatherings. Um, let's see here. You know, so uh, I think uh, the regular convenings in person um, and sharing a meal, having a general conversation about whatever topic, you know, topic of the day or just whatever was on the news or whatever our children, grandchildren are, have been doing, et cetera. I think that that was very important because again, it, it reaches, goes to this, this uh, this point that's being made today around relationship, I found that I, I, I that was very rewarding, uh, and uh, and again, I guess joking aside, to nourish our bodies, that is very important. There are times where I think that food is is so critical to the convening of people. Remember during my college days, we used to offer pizza, and you got a lot more participation that way too, and so um, that was important. But I guess I'll transition to challenging. You know, there there were times where there were tough conversations, right? We had tough conversations. We were coming back from different backgrounds uh, and whether th those were conversations around race, uh, whether they were conversations around the speed of the work itself. Um, you know, we all come from, from, from a different perspective. As Melissa already indicated, we had folks that are more process, others that were relationship, others that were like product, like we need to get this done. And why why hasn't this gotten done? So I think that in itself was was a challenge as well to be in a sea with multiple individuals with different backgrounds and potentially expectations as well. And again, there were uh, conversations, news of the day around race, around law enforcement, right, around community. And, and I think those are those were that that was challenging, but also to me, I found those very interesting. Those were very very interesting and. Um, you know, I, yeah, I'll pause there. What about you, Doug? Anything additionally that was rewarding for you and what was challenging? Well, I think I've already said what the, the rewarding part, you know, is just the relationships and being able to, to hang out with people that, that I like. Um, the, the, um, 
um, challenges as, as what Leo said, um, you know, some very difficult subjects came up and just in, in the news cycle and we were kind of dealing with him. And I know that, I know that there was some, some, uh, some pretty tough times where people who, you know, different groups got a little bit offended and felt like that they were being, you know, kind of stepped on and not, and not being heard for what they were really saying. And, and those are the hard questions that, and the hard issues that have to be um, addressed. And, and I think because of the fact that there was relationships formed and because of the fact that there was trust formed, that we could have those conversations and, and not just walk away from the process totally. Um, Cause that so often is what you see happen is that when somebody gets offended, they just, you know, take their toys and leave. Um, I think the people that in this group are, are willing to, to make the sacrifice to be uncomfortable. And that's, that's probably the biggest challenge. Thanks so much, Doug. Um, and I also want to just lift up what Sandy um, put in the chat as well. Um, I don't know, Sandy, if our times on the on the team ever crossed over. It really makes me sad <laughs> that I didn't get a chance to to meet with you and talk with you more. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to elevate what Sandy said in the chat about in her short time on the team was amazed by the perspectives and individuals um, she would have never had otherwise met, and a, and it was a mind opening experience. So just thank you for for saying that. I just wanted to elevate um, that experience in here as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move us to our next question, which is, um, you know, what is uh, one of the most important things you've learned from this process um, that you would share with other folks who are trying to build these teams? So what, what would you share from that learning experience? And Doug, I'm going to start with you this time. Well, I think I would, I would share that, that it's a benefit to your community. And if you take the time to get to know those professionals in your community who are doing the work um, and, and step outside of the silos that we tend to put ourselves in, um, you'll see a, um, a real um, flourishing. You'll see, you'll see good things happen. Um, the other thing is, is I would, that I encourage in some things, I was involved in um, multidisciplinary teams for many years back in the early 90s and and I think that um, one of the things that that um, was most important was the facilitators if you have good facilitators you ended up with good teams so if you can find those people in your community um, that really have those skills you're going to have a whole lot more success Thanks, Doug. Sorry. sorry, sorry, Melissa. Um, Leo, do you want to answer that next about what is one of the most important things you learned from this process that you want to share? I sure can. Um, you know, so it does take time, right? So I was right in a sense. It's, it takes time. It takes time, but I, I think again, once you, if you believe in the project, if you believe in the vision, then then I think that the time goes much faster. Um, because it's an investment uh, towards something you want to accomplish in partnership with others. And, you know, I, I, again, I, I earlier when I started, I, I said, you know, this could be another meeting after meeting and study after study and then, and then what. Um, but I was left and continue to be impressed by the emphasis on, um, on communities, on individuals on, that have historically been on the margins and that I think is very important for me, again, as, as a person of color, as a person that works with historically marginalized communities, it's very critical, right? As, as we begin to look at systems and how systems need to be transformed and changed um, and, and analyzed, that's, that's very important. I remember there was one story uh, that, that we read, uh, it was around, and I'm not sure what this, if this was the, the right title, because this was a while ago, the story of rape. Right. This was the, the, the story uh, uh, of a young individual in the foster care system that the system, the entire system, and that's a lot of folks, right? The, unbel the unbelievable story of rape that, uh, that have failed uh, the, uh, the young person. And, and, and that to me, you know, was, uh, I really, uh, you know, I learned so much from that story as well with regards to systems. 
And, and again, you know, this was one individual marginalized community that others decided not to believe. And, and oftentimes I think that individuals who are in marginalized communities, you know, as I speak for myself as, as a person of color, there are times like I say, uh, do I really want to go to the police, right? Or why should I go to the police? Um, and, uh, and again, these are these shared experiences of marginalized communities and, and really digging into the systems of where it has failed is so, so important to look, okay, what do we do? What do we need to do to make sure that this doesn't happen? And I have stories from community members, again, who have, who have called on law enforcement, investigations have been done and said, mm -mm, not founded, right? It's like not enough information, but the community member absolutely believes that something did happen and so on. And so again, that's, I point to that story in part because it allowed for reflection analysis and for all of us, as participants to have a conversation about it. Um, so that was very important. Yeah, as Jen is gonna set up our last video to share from one of our members who works in systems, Leo, um, I put that in the chat, the unbelievable story of rape. And I think that is essential for all of us in systems to hear over and over again, is that there are some folks that just are intimidated or don't wanna come forward. And we see that stat all the time. That doesn't mean we're bad people. What I notice in the team is sometimes we personalize ourselves instead of systems. We have to stop doing that. And if we really are gonna make a dent and an impact and changing systems and the lives of others, we have to take ourselves out of that. Thank you, Leo. Go, Jen. I mean, I think that, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't, I just, I just have a difficult time believing that, or I, maybe I don't want to believe. And so I'm just going to say, I believe that most um, people who are doing um, work in communities are doing work in communities because they want to make their communities better and they want to help the people in their communities <clears throat> and so if you have people who are reticent to do a coordinated group like this or to even discuss some of the topics that we discussed or do the difficult work that a lot of times we did um or are concerned about this idea of centering um, on victims or even centering on underserved or marginalized populations, I guess I would, I would want them to think about, would you want another agency at the table in when they were doing their work to say, hmm, I don't really care about that group of people. Um, or um if that group of people suffers it's okay they don't really need services they're going to be fine um i don't think any of us feel comfortable that i i can't imagine okay wait i can imagine i don't know what i'm trying to say i think what i'm trying to say is to do this kind of work you have to i, I you have to be willing to say that it's not just about people who look like you, who believe like you, who act like you. If we're gonna serve our communities, we have to serve everybody in our communities. And if we're gonna serve everybody in our communities, then that means we have to make the table bigger to have more people at the table who represent all the various aspects of our community at the table. Because if they're not at the table, then I will tell you right now, you will likely have a much more difficult time reaching those populations, serving those populations and making your overall community better because they will be missing. They will be invisible and they will not be present. And even if you do think that they're there, they're not going to, they're not going to be open to you reaching out to them because you have not done anything to build that trust. So we have to make the table bigger and we have to be okay with that. And we have to understand that we are better by making the table better. Uh, we're better by making the table bigger uh, than we are with the way the tables used to look five, 10, 20, 
30 years ago when I started. I know we're cutting it really close on time, but that was Dr. Lisa Bostaff at Boise State University, um, who I'm sure a lot of you know or have seen her reports and studies on what she would recommend to folks forming other teams like these. And so I know we're running up on time. I didn't see any questions in the chat, but I just wanna say thank you for spending time with us today. Um, like Melissa stated at the beginning, we are gonna get all y'all's contact information so that we can go ahead and forward you the toolkit um, you know, once we have it finalized and ready to go for your use. Um, if there are any questions at all, we invite you to reach out to us as well. Um, we'll make sure that our email addresses are available to you after the session also, um, so that you can just ask us anything that you might need or any support you might have. Um, and we would love to know if you are willing to throw in the chat, what is one thing you're taking from this presentation? Um, we also understand if you have to pop off and um, go to your next session. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks, everyone. It was so good to see you. Thanks for joining us. We're available for any questions. I think um, Tamara linked the evaluation. Um, in the chat a little bit ago. So if folks are looking for that, I saw someone ask a question about that. And then Christine, I don't know, but I will find an answer for you. <laughs> um, but thank you for asking that. Yeah, if there's anything you're gonna take away from this, share it. Looks like the evaluation was posted again. Ken was helping us with that. Awesome. Okay. I wanted to piggyback on a comment that Leo made about the meals. And I thought, not, not, I mean, the meals were great, but it, because we started an hour early, before the actual work started, it really gave us some intentional time just to sit and be with, the, with, the, with each other and share a meal and do the things like Leo talked about, talk about our kids and how are things going and how's everybody in your agency doing and sort of those conversations that you don't normally get to have in these professional settings to really build on the relationship building. And I got so excited to go to those lunches just because it was my time to like hog every minute I could get with anybody that I could talk to because they were all so wonderful. I really look forward to that opportunity. And I can't say that that happens in every one of the types of meetings I have to go to. And that was intentional. I, I appreciated that being set up that way. Thanks, Christine. We're always a big fan of having food and intentional time to just connect over food with folks prior to meeting. All right. Well, think about, think about how busy people and systems are, right? That, slow, that makes us slow down. And um, that's what we've been missing in our work. We, we have to slow, slow down, build those relationships and understand and get to know folks. Absolutely. It informs us. All right, I'm not seeing any questions specifically in the chat box right now. So I guess what we'll leave you with is it's not, this work isn't easy. It can be really traumatic for folks um, to have these conversations again, um, but the, and it challenges to really reflect the way we view the world and how we got to view the world that way. But it's such important work to do that requires so much empathy. Um, and so it's just a good learning experience overall and the lessons you learn here, you will take. Um, you know, outside of this space as well. And just Deanna, thank you so much. It was really awesome having you in the space too. And hopefully we can have lunch at some point in the future all together again. Um, but just remember that one of the most important things for coordinated community responses is that it's just take the time and slow down to learn, uh, to learn things together, to get to know each other, to get to learn more about each other. You know, you might've been in space with someone for 10 years, but that doesn't mean you truly know them. Um, you know, the way that this space allows and this, this allows us to do that, to really transform our communities, because what we all want is a world without violence, right? So that we don't have to deal with this anymore. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much.